book of Malachi is a very important book because it was the last message that God gave Israel before Jesus came. And uh, there's always something important about when God gives his last message. When Jesus, before he ascended, went back to heaven, he gave a, a last message to his disciples, and that was the Great Commission. There's always just something important about when God gives something um, that you've got to hold to before he comes again. So think about that. But in Malachi chapter 3, we're just going to read a few verses here. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Behold, I will send my messenger... And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner, and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now jump down to verse number 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye have gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the good singing, the good prayer time, the good fellowship time. Lord, you're a good God. Everything you're part of is good. Lord, we just want to bless you and thank you for all that you've done. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd put a hedge about us. I pray that, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, you'd minister to us. There are some who are... Oh, Lord, struggling. There are some who have faced a, a tragedy. There are some who have faced a, a hardship. There are some, uh, uh, Lord, they've had a good week, but uh, tomorrow's another day if you don't come back, and they may face hard, or hardship or tragedy. So, Father, I pray you do something in our hearts that, Lord, will propel us uh, over tomorrow's snares and obstacles, uh, that, Lord, we might shine as lights in this dark world, that we might make a difference, uh, that, God, we might be all that you would have us to be. Uh, now, bless as only you can. Use this unworthy vessel uh, and glorify your name. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Uh, and amen. And amen. I want you to notice a few things as a way of introduction. I want you to notice, first of all, the reassurance. Notice the reassurance. Uh, uh, in verse number 1, the Lord says, Behold, I will send my messenger, uh, and he shall prepare the way before me. Uh, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant uh, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, uh, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, aren't you glad uh, when uh, you don't think there's any hope, the Lord's got a word uh, to reassure you uh, and to give you some strength. Uh, now, verse number 1, he's talking about uh, the one who would prepare the way of the Lord. He's speaking of John the Baptist. Uh, and we know that John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. Uh, he came preaching. Uh, and we know uh, 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 that it wasn't much longer after that that the Lord Jesus himself started his earthly ministry. Uh, uh, you remember what John said when he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Uh, uh, and we know uh, 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 that he was the forerunner. And it's speaking of Jesus when he would come. Now the problem Israel had and still has today, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for him to come and sit on David's throne and rule with a rod of iron. He will. What they did not choose to see, even though we could take you over to Micah, we can take you to Isaiah, we can take you to Jeremiah, they did not see the prophecies concerning him coming as the child be born of a virgin. They did not see him coming uh, in the uh, uh, way that he would, that he might uh, usher in grace and truth, uh, and that he might shed his blood to be the Savior. So one day he would come back as Messiah. So we see the reassurance. And I notice the refiner. Look in verse number 2. 
but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeared? For he is like a a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. My dear friends, the only way we can offer an offering in righteousness is we must be robed in righteousness. And he came as the refiner. He said he would be like a refiner's fire. And can I say the refiner's fire purifies, it purges, it prepares, uh, it proves, and it prevails. uh, 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 And thank the Lord for those things. Because when Jesus saved you and I, uh, 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 all those things that were ordinances uh, and uh, uh, handwritings against us, he took them out of the way. Uh, He robed us in his righteousness. He justified us by faith. Uh, uh, He sealed us into the day of redemption uh, 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 that you and I could be the vessels of God and be used of God Uh, and so we see the refiner we see the reassurance notice the refuge in verse number 6 we can take refuge in what God says he says for I am the Lord I change not therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed aren't you glad that God doesn't shift with the signs and times of the day Aren't you glad that God uh, isn't worried about taking polls every day to see what uh, people think of him so he can adjust so that he'll be well liked? Uh, He changes not. He is the I am. He's always in the present tense. uh, Isn't that wonderful? We can take refuge in that. You know why that's important? I don't know about you, but I've I've been saved 43 years. The message hasn't changed. You listen to some of the preaching today and you, you think, well, wait a second, that's, that's changed a whole lot from when I got in. I'm glad God doesn't change. I'm glad the message is still the same. I'm glad Jesus still seeks to save sinners. And I'm glad for the fact that God doesn't change. Aren't you glad He doesn't change? Aren't you glad His yeas are still yeas and His nays are nay? Hmm? Aren't you glad there are some things we don't have to receive even though society receives them? Because God hadn't changed his opinion about sin. He hadn't changed his opinion about things. He changes not, and because of that, we're not consumed. Amen. I want you to notice, if you will, the requirement in this passage. Verse number 7, he says, Even from the days of your fathers you have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Notice the requirement. God has said, you're not consumed even though you have strayed from my ordinances. Your fathers have strayed from my ordinances. You haven't kept them. But God in His long-suffering, God in His mercy, God being a gracious God says, return unto me. Just like when He went seeking after Adam down in the garden. He said, Adam, where art thou? God knew where He was. But He was trying to reestablish the relationship that had now been broken by sin. He says, return unto me and I will return unto you. James said it this way, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. When you take a step towards God, he takes a step towards you. When you strayed from God, you need to turn, repent, turn to God, and just keep walking towards him until you bump into him. Are you listening? Uh, There are some requirements to get God on the scene. We have to return to him, then he returns to us. Notice, if you will, the robbery. Everybody knows this. And when you say Malachi 3, everybody thinks preachers are going to preach on money. Huh? I heard several of you gasp when I, when I said, turn here. <laughs> Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Hmm? I, I used to hesitate taking my jacket off because I figured if the house of God had robbers in it, they might steal my coat. But uh, there are some folks that do not understand. Can I say this about, and I'm, I'm not going to preach on tithing, y'all relax. No. But can I say this? It's always about faith. Amen. See, God can take your 10% plus an offering to make it go a whole lot farther than you can make your 100% go. Amen. You just got to have faith enough that God will. Hmm. It's just a faith issue. Folks that don't tithe just don't believe God is able to sustain them. 
Now, it amazes me, Miss Marcy, that people can believe God is a big enough God to save them and take them to heaven. They just don't believe He can sustain them and provide for them. Hmm? Do you know the Jews wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and their shoes never wore out? But I promise you, somebody that doesn't tie, their shoes wear out pretty quick. Uh, you know their clothes didn't wear out? Huh? Those that don't tie, their clothes are all the time getting tore up. they got to go buy new clothes. huh? Their washing machines get tore up. Their car tires don't last long. You know, I had a I had an old beater truck one time. You may ask missing that. It had 120,000 miles on the tires, and they still look new. Didn't that lady hit it? Huh? They did. I drove that thing, drove that thing, and I mean, we didn't have much extra money, and, you know, Jordan ate us out of house and home. And so, <laughs> that's the truth. Jordan weighed 25 pounds at six weeks. I'm not kidding you, man. He was a butterball. Uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, I had that truck for I don't know how many years, and I think we might have changed the oil in it three or four times. You know, you're supposed to change the oil back then every 3,000 miles. Mercy, we just getting started at 3,000. Every 30,000, we was getting it changed. <laughs> Thing just kept a running. Uh-uh. Why God? You put God first. Everything else is it takes care. Of. Now I would not suggest putting your tithe and offering in and not changing oil in your car the rest of your life. But I'm just telling you, God took care of us. Amen. Huh? Amen. It's a faith thing. You know, Brother Lawrence was telling me the other day. He's listening to some preacher because I know he didn't get because he steals everything. <laughs> Says so listen to this preacher, and this preacher said. For those Jews, they estimate there was about 6 million Jews came out of Egypt. Could have been up to 10 million. He said in order just to provide water for that crowd, it was 9 million gallons of water a day. 11 million gallons of water a day. $9 million it would cost a day to feed and, and, and give them water every day. And yet for 40 years, God didn't miss it. Nine million dollars a day. You don't think he can take care of you? Huh? It's a faith way. Now notice the remedy. We'll get to the message. Verse 10. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I'm interested, verse number 10, where he says, Prove me now. There's just something about when you prove God. I mean, when you buy a car, don't you test drive it? You don't take the slick tongue uh, used car salesman's word for it that some little granny just threw over to church on Sunday and here it is. You take it out and if you're smart, you go have a mechanic look at it. You pull the dipstick out, make sure there ain't sludge in it. You're proving that car before you buy it. Hmm? Before you invest in it. You go buy a new suit, fellas, you don't just grab one and go pay for it. You try it on, don't you? If not, you're going to Miss Sunny and say, make this thing fit me. <laughs> and then she looks at you and says, there's not enough material there for it to fit you. Uh, ladies, I know you try on every dress at, at Dillard's before you buy one. You're proving them. You're looking in the mirror, make sure it looks all right. Well, the Lord says that we're to bring our tithes and offerings into the storehouse, that he is a, uh, he changeth not, and that we're to return unto him. And he's given us this whole chapter to get down to this one phrase, prove me now. God is saying, take me at my word and see if you can find any fault in me. He says, I'll open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing, you can't receive it. Prove me now. And so with God's help for just a few minutes tonight, I want to preach on that thought, how to prove the Lord. How to prove Him. He didn't say tempt Him. He said to prove Him. So how do we prove the Lord? Well, first of all, you prove the Lord by submitting to His commandments. In verse number 7, He says, Even from the days of your fathers you've gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. 
If you're going to prove the Lord, it starts with His Word. You've got to put your trust in what God said and do what God says to do. Submit to what God says. Don't worry about what Joe Wolstein says. Don't worry about what Franklin Graham says. Don't even worry about what the preacher says. You better worry about what God said because you're going to be judged out of every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And it's not enough to carry a King James Bible and say you got the Word of God. You You've got to do what God says. Uh, and when you put it into practice and you heed to it and you apply it to your life, uh, you're proving God. You're taking Him at His word. You said, God, uh, if I'll do this, then God, you'll do that. So God, I'm just going to take you at your word uh, and just watch and see that God will never fail you. Uh, the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. And if He pinned it down, and He did, you can take Him at His word. But you've got to submit to it. Too many people want to fight against it. You know what I've found over the years? There are some people who want to read the Bible just enough to see how much they can get by with. If I live this close, I can still hang on to the world with this hand. No, you can't. It's all or nothing with God. You've got to submit that you're going to do what God say, says uh, regardless of popular opinion, regardless of what your family says, uh, regardless of what the church down the street says. Uh, uh, you're just going to make up your mind. I'm going to trust Jesus. Uh, I'm going to take God His word, uh, and I'm going to stand on it. Uh, when all of heaven and all of earth passes away, I'll still be standing because I'm standing on the word of God. Uh, you've got to submit to His commands. We've got one rule around here. Mind the Lord. If He says it, do it. And if you do, you'll find you'll be blessed beyond your own recognition. Really, what charge can you throw against God if you take inventory of your life in the last year and look at all that God's done in your life? What, what charge can you say, God, you let me down? No. You really take inventory, you'll find He's been holding you up. Yes, Most of the time through his long suffering because we haven't truly submitted to what he says it, it just uh, the reason preachers have gray hair or no hair is people will listen but they don't heed they let the word go in one ear and out the other if we just do what God says oh we'd be so much farther along than where we are you prove the Lord by submitting to his commands you prove the Lord by stepping out in faith Our day and age is a sight day and age. We want to see it all come to fruition, then we're going to believe it. Doesn't work that way. So you've got to take God at His word, but you've got to step out on faith. God says to, just do it. Don't question it. Don't try to figure it out. There's no logic in faith. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, Without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. My dear friends, faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Uh, see, if I could see a step here, and I stepped out on it, and I said, boy, I'm stepping out on faith. No, that's logic. If God told me to step out, and I don't see a step, and I step out, I'm just going to believe he's going to hold me up. He didn't, so I'm not, because I don't want to break my neck in front of y'all. But stepping out on faith is just following God, whether or not you can see light at the end of the tunnel or not. Whether or not you can see that there's anything out there to hold you or not. God said, do it, just do it. And Brother Lawrence came to me and said he had a burden to start an addictions ministry. We, we had really no idea what we was going to get into. We really didn't. We started researching some things and praying about some things, and it just seemed like when he was committed to do it, everything just fell right in place. Only God can have him talk to a guy run a car. Wash. Now, listen, if I was going to look for somebody to give money, the last guy I'd go to is the car wash guy. I'd be going to banker guy. Huh? I'd be going to office manager guy. I'd be going to guy suit and tie, look good. I'm not going to guy when it's below zero at a car wash. I'm thinking that guy's crippled too high for crutches. But who God doesn't God choose the base things found of wise? That old hymn writer said, "Where he leadeth, I will follow." Mm. You see, when you step out on faith, 
God's able to do tremendous things. He says, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show you the great and mightiest things which thou knowest not. A lot of times we're quick to call, but we're not quick to follow. Miss Annette and I was talking about, you know, some of the similarities of what's going on in this hope thing of when I, I left that corporate job for $150 a week. What much logic in that step? But it's worked out pretty good. Uh, we started this hope ministry with nothing. We already got churches taking it on, and we haven't ever even presented to a church. How does that happen, God? Uh, I only met that guy one time, and Brother Lawrence hadn't seen him in years. He just texts him out of blue. Kids up here practicing for the Christmas program. Brother Lawrence is sitting there, gets a text from a pastor that said, heard you starting a Dixon ministry. We're going to supply Bibles. So sent 10 Bibles this week and, and all kinds of other uh, uh, new converts materials and stuff like that. Say, how does that happen? The Lord honors faith. Amen. Can I say this? How do you prove the Lord? By seeking His face. Hmm? By seeking His face. I've, I've preached on this before. The great recipe for revival, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. I have no doubt that most independent Baptists would have no problem swallowing their pride and humble themselves and pray for revival. I have no doubt most independent Baptists would pr would pray. I have no doubt that if God showed them they had sin in their life he wasn't pleased with, they'd turn from it. But the one portion of that equation that we don't ever really focus on is seeking his face. It's amazing we'll seek the news. You know the weatherman's going to lie to you, but you listen to him every, every night anyway. Huh? We seek our sports teams. We, 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 we seek things on the job. We... We seek uh, uh, for better lifestyles. We seek all kinds of things but the face of God. As Brother J.D. preached the other night, Moses sought to see his face. God said, you can't see me and live. So people say, well, I'm not going to see him. I don't want to die. My dear friends, what the Lord told him when he put him in that cliff of the rock, he said, you seek my face, and I'll show you my glory. And there's the key. We've got to seek the face of the Lord, and we'll see His glory. And by the way, when you seek His face, you do die. You have to die out to yourself. You have to die out to sin. You won't seek God's face when you're still looking at yourself. But can I say this? Seeking His face is more than just saying, I'm going to seek the face of the Lord. We need to seek it in prayer. Our prayer closets, We've got too many cobwebs in them. We've got to spend more time in prayer seeking God's face. Not bringing him a shopping list of what we want him to do. Spending time with him saying, Lord, I just want to see you. Just spend time with him, communing with him. Spend time with him, praising him, telling him how wonderful he is and thanking him for all that he's done. And say, Lord, I just want to see you. I just want to have you touch on me. I just want to have your presence in my life. We've got to seek him in prayer. Then we seek him in his promises. Always gets back to his word. You start seeking God on every page. You know who you're going to find on every page? Him even in some of the obscure things you get down there to all them begats and you start thinking about God pinned all them names down just remind me he pinned my name down in heaven you'll find, you'll find him everywhere Amen. but then you got to seek him in your daily pathways see every day our life is as a parable every day the Lord is trying to teach us something when he was on earth he taught his disciples using parables it would be an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and every day he's trying to teach us something. Every day he's trying to say, uh, uh, you went through this thing and you went through that thing because I'm just trying to teach. Can I give you an example today? There's a real life example. Um, Miss Annette, uh, Cindy's team, and they, they're on their way to Nashville to play down there. And, and uh, you know, we didn't get to do much with them last year. So uh, Miss Annette wanted to cook lunch for the team as they come through. So she sent me to the store this morning. There's a couple things. I had to pick up ice. I had to pick up a couple things. So I go to the store. I got ice. I got a thing of coffee in case anyone wanted coffee. And I got some eggs. Three things. Not bad. 
three things. And out. Boom. Well, I got this big old bag of ice. These three things. I don't want to do self-serve, put that ice down, because I don't know where the barcode is on it, so I'm going into 15 item or less. I'll be quick, right? <laughs> Second person in line. Lady in front of me. Nice lady. Had a little girl in the buggy. She only bought about eight things. Fruit. Why anybody want to eat fruit? I don't know. Sugar is much better. But, but she bought fruit, fruit. And it was all the individual fruit. Which they got to weigh and look up the price and put in the thing. Ernest T. Bass's sister's running the register. I mean, she's looking at this fruit, and I'm going, it's a banana, and I don't even eat fruit, but that's a banana. And then she's trying to find out what kind of fruit it is. It's a banana. Huh? I'm in a hurry. I got three items. Hey, Ernest T., let's move it. I'm sitting there trying not to have a meltdown, and you know what? I'm thinking... Lord, just teach me patience today. So I was just calm. That lady in front of me, she was getting frustrated. She looked back at me and rolled her eyes. She's thinking, why in the world I wanted to buy this fruit today? I don't know. Ernest T. Bass's sister's running the register. And I can see she's about ready to have a meltdown. But I didn't. I just sitting there. Uh, just calm. And the thought came unto me. No sense of getting in a hurry. Get out there, somebody probably hit my truck. I'll just hang out here with Ernestine's sister. It'll be all right. Got there, she was nice. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you today? I'm good. Good. Ring up the ice, okay? I've been here long enough. Huh? You see, sometimes God is just trying to teach us things, and sometimes He's trying to help us avoid things. And God's timetable is not our timetable. But if you seek His face in your daily pathway, you know what you'll find? You'll find Him. I mean, I could have easily got frustrated. I could have easily packed all that stuff up and went to another one and waited there too. But I just got to thinking, what's the Lord trying to teach me? And I'm, I'm thinking about Job. He's thinking about Job. And I'm thinking, no, the Lord's not trying to teach me about Job. Uh, but the thought came... No sense of being in a hurry. Somebody out there might be in an accident or something. I'll just hang out here. And what I'm trying to say is the Lord will lower your heart rate if you start seeking His face in them situations you normally wouldn't seek His face. Huh? That's how you prove Him. I didn't, I didn't get all stressed out. Normally I would. Normally I'd... Never mind. Anyway. How do you prove the Lord? You prove the Lord by standing in adversity. Can I say, anybody can serve the Lord when you're on the mountaintop. When all the bills are paid, the kids aren't sick, and you don't have any problems. I don't know what those days look like, but if you ever have one of those days, anybody can stand up and say, God is good. It's good all the time. Yeah. But when you're down in the valley and you're lower than the dirt in the valley... It seems like everything comes against you. I mean, you're paying your tithes, you're going to church faithfully, you're reading your Bible, you're trying to seek the Lord, and it seems like instead of things are getting better, they're getting worse. It seems like the devil has his imps on speed dial, and they're all focused on you. You know what you need to do? Just keep standing. When he gave us the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Just keep standing. Look, we like that old song Ronnie Henson wrote in the early 70s, it's the lighthouse, and Jesus is the lighthouse. And people drive all over the, the eastern seaboard to see those lighthouses. They are pretty impressive. But you know what a lighthouse does? It just stands there. Now back when those that were captains of ships piloted down through the seaboard they did it by the lighthouse and by sending off those uh, horns to see how many fathoms they were from shore but those lighthouses helped direct them aren't you glad if you was a captain ship that lighthouse didn't crumble under the waves and under the storms and everything just kept standing yes. you know what Jesus told us to do to be lights under this world yes. he just wants us to stand so they talk about you. Keep standing. So uh, uh, you face this trial. Just keep standing. Uh, so uh, 
Seems like all the world's coming against you. Just keep standing because you're anchored to the rock. And he's not going anywhere. So just stand. And when you stand in adversity, you are proving the Lord. You know what lost people really want to know about you and I? Whether or not we're real. Do you know how many folks that I've seen in the 40 plus years that I've been saved that claim to be saved and they didn't have anything to them? Far more than I want to, want to recall. Do you know how many preachers I've seen fall? Do you know how many Sunday school teachers I've seen fall? Do you know how many deacons I've seen get out of the race? Do you know how many people I used to hear sing that they no longer sing about Jesus? Far more than I want to uh, 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 talk about tonight. But if I see them, what do you think about those that work with them, those that are related to them, uh, uh, those that said it'll come to pass, and when it came to pass, said, see, I told you so. Uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, the world has got too many excuses. Why not the flood the church uh, what we need to do is stand in adversity uh, so if nothing else God can say they all didn't go bad uh, there were some that stood true in the midst of it all Amen. and I promise you when that wave looks like it's about ready to take you under and you just keep standing he'll stand up and he'll take on your wave and prove me now you prove the Lord by standing in adversity can I say anybody can quit world's full of quitters you know what separates winners from quitters winners just keep standing some of the greatest most inspiring stories of those people that they get knocked down and keep getting back up they just keep standing yeah. quitter gets knocked down they go crawl off in a corner somewhere they can quit but if you've really got the Lord on the inside of you, there's a little fire shut up in your bones. Can't you want to get back up? Well, listen, I've known some that failed to sin, but I've seen them get right with God. I've seen them go on and do more for God after they failed than they went before because they realized there's something tremendous about grace. I've seen them be a better witness. I've seen them be more faithful to the house of God. Just because they tell everybody, yeah, I fell, but Jesus never failed me. Uh, just stand in adversity. And I say this, if you're going to prove God, you've got to do it by saturating yourself with God's desires. What's wrong with our churches, what's wrong with society is um, people are saturated with worldly desires. You start saturating yourself with godly desires, you're going to prove the Lord. What are His desires? First of all, it's God's desire to regenerate sinners. Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. When you get a burden for sinners, guess what? The Lord's for you. Matter of fact, the greatest burden is there is no burden today. I thought about this. We saturate ourselves with what God desires. What he, he, he desires revival for the saints. I believe he stands at the banister ready to pour revival out on this, this old world again. He's just waiting for somebody to ask for it. Somebody be willing to pay the price. Amen. And then I thought about this. God is saturated with the desire. We need to saturate ourselves with this desire is that he is to be reverenced and worshipped. You know why he made man? That we'd bring honor and glory to him. That we would choose to bring honor and glory to him. He made us with a will. You know, the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. And they've seen, we've never seen him. But when we trust him by faith and we are willing to reverence and worship him every day of our life and then in, in the congregation of the saints to worship him in spirit and in truth, oh, that honors God. Thought about this. How are we going to prove him? Serve him with expectation. I come to church expecting God to show up. I come to church expecting sinners to get saved, expecting saints of God to get help. I read the Bible expecting God to show me something. I'm expecting God to do something in this addiction ministry. I'm not hoping that, I'm expecting him to. 
Because he's the one that's done it all at this point. I'm expecting him to. When you serve with expectation, you're proving God. Listen. In the sports arena, they start out the season, every team has expectation they're going to win the championship. Now, it only takes a couple weeks and you figure out most of them aren't. But they work all off season expecting to be the final victor. Hmm? Well, if they do that for something as goofy as sports, and I love sports, you know that. Why wouldn't we give it our all to serve with expectation? You know, there's some people that serve in hopes that God will take notice of them and pat them on the back somewhere along the line. You know why I serve him? Because he first loved me. I serve him because all that he has done for me, it is a joy to get to do anything for him. And if I'm going to do something for him, then I'm going to expect him to do great things because that's just the way he is. Let me say this lastly. Some of you are about to faint. How we prove the Lord? He said, prove me now by seeing it through. He told his disciples, before you start building a tower, count the cost. That once you start, you're not able to finish it. You become a mockery before men. Don't ever launch out and do anything unless you have God's assurance. He's giving you a verse. That's what he wants. But once you've got assurance from God, see it through. Just give it all you got. See it through. Finish what you start. The Apostle Paul, and I know we Baptists got him right up there next to the Lord Jesus, although he wasn't. Paul wasn't even the greatest preacher. Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest, greatest man born among women. But the Paul, he did, the Apostle Paul did find favor at God. He wrote half the New Testament. Man greatly used of God, even though when you read Paul's testimony, he said when he would do good, he wouldn't, that he would do, he did it not. Those things he wouldn't do, that he ended up doing. He said, oh, wretched man, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul's the one who said he had to die daily. Die out to sin daily. But when it's all said and done, even though most of his Christian life he spent in jail, spent under house arrest, been beaten and stoned and left for dead, it's all said and done, Paul said, I fought a good fight. He said, I kept the faith. He said, I finished my course. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not to me only, but unto all them also who love his appearing. Paul said, I finish my course. You want to prove God, finish your course. Get in it to finish it. You know how many people in the 18 years I've been here said, Preacher, I want to do something for the Lord. So well, what do you want to do? Well, I believe God wants me to do this. All right, do it. Only in a few weeks, they'll not do it anymore. Do you know how many jobs other people have had to pick up because somebody started something and didn't finish it? Just finish it. See it through. Oh, you'll face the obstacles. Just see it through. I promise you, if God's in the midst of it, the devil's going to do everything he can to get you sidetracked. Amen. Just see it through. Good News Prisms Industry out of this church has been there, man, 30 years. Had four saved Sunday. I don't think we need to quit, do you? Let's just see it through. Huh? Whatever God puts on your heart, just see it through. In the end, when you finish your course, you'll be glad you did. He said, prove me now. Why don't we just prove the Lord? Take him at his word and prove him. Huh? 
You know what you find when you take God at his word? <laughs> you find he's a whole lot more than just Savior. He's Lord. Yeah. Amen. I had a man tell me this years ago, and I'll tell you. You want to get God on the scene? When you pray, just pray his word to him. When you remind God of what God said, God honors it. Huh? Just prove him. And you know what will be said when you're done proving him? The same thing Pilate said when he looked at Jesus. I find no fault in him. He far exceeded anything I ever thought he would. He's been faithful and true. And he's done everything he said and then some. And yes, he does know how to open a window and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. So I challenge you, prove the Lord. And in so doing, you'll be blessed and so will all those around you because they'll see what God's done in your life. Let's all stand tonight, Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Maybe you need to come thank the Lord for being good to you. Maybe he spoke to your heart about something that areas in your life you need to prove him. Just come and talk to him about it. Maybe you've got somebody on your heart that needs the Lord. Why don't you come and talk to the Lord about it? Maybe tonight he's spoke to you about something else. Why don't you just do business with God tonight? Folks who come to the altar, they're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, thank you for being the refiner, being our refuge, being our rock. Lord, thank you for all the choice promises of the word of God. Thank you for being our shepherd tonight. Thank you, Lord, for, oh, so many times proven. Lord, you are God in our hearts and in our lives. Now, Father, I pray you'd bless this invitation now. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight unsaved, I pray that the sweet Holy Spirit would sneak up close to them and through cords of love draw them, Lord, to salvation. Lord, help them to come. We'll take a Bible and show them how to be saved. Maybe there's somebody here saved, but they've just grown cold. I pray they'd come. Lord, you'd ignite that fire down, shut up in their bones, warm their heart. Maybe some here tonight got a burden. I pray you'd help them. Maybe some are low. I pray you'd lift them up. Maybe some, Lord, are needy. I pray you'd meet those needs in Christ Jesus. Lord, maybe somebody has something else on their heart tonight. Some just want to come and thank you. Lord, I pray that, Lord, your will be done. This invitation, speak to hearts. And help us, Lord, to stay the course. Be faithful. Lord, because we represent you who is faithful and true. Blessed now, we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen.